What's up, gangsters? How about episode six of the foil adventure with the Edward 148th Mustang? This episode is going to be a little bit different because uh, I took a little bit of a break after all that sanding and priming on the, the wings. Um, and uh, so I don't have a whole lot to, to, to talk about as far as the, 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 the work itself. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go over some quick things with test fitting all of the small bits that go on the wing and the fuselage. And then I'm going to do a bunch of Q&A because I've, I've got a lot of questions that have been coming in that I haven't even uh, addressed. And I didn't think I was going to do this, but there's been enough of them and there's some good questions in there that seems like a worthwhile thing to do. So let's just get right into it. Okay, I think I'll start with the wing. That's pretty straightforward. I have uh, uh, test fitted these uh, ailerons and uh, they fit like a dream exactly like I like for stuff like this to fit they've got this uh, little tab and slot thing going on here and it's a pretty tight f slip fit there but that's what you want for something like that they just slide in there and honestly they'd probably stay there forever without any glue uh, the other thing that I uh, have to do with the uh, with the wing is because I screwed up. I just assumed without checking first that the uh, that a brand new Mustang out of the factory might not have pylons. That was dumb. They do. So I blew off drilling the holes uh, right here that are required to mount those. So I'm gonna have to do that from the outside, but. That's not too big of a deal. Uh, no hill for a stepper. Um, the other thing that I have to do uh, is uh, take care of uh, filling and rescribing uh, these uh, access panels here. That's called out in the instructions, and I just haven't gotten to uh, doing that yet. I haven't done any scribing yet, really, so other than just a little bit of cleanup around, uh, you know, that that thing right there after I did all the, the body work. All right, I've also got the flaps assembled and uh, they also are a, a very nice fit. Uh, you can see they've just got these little tabs that uh, poke into those uh, receptacles and they just I just go right in there like that. Um, it, it brings the, up the question though, um, you know, <laughs> what if you wanted to do this thing in flight and you didn't want the flaps to be down? Well, you'd kind of be, you'd kind of be screwed. Um, but it is the way it is. And it's nice to see that it's a nice, f that it's nice to see that it's a nice fit. Now, one thing about the flaps that is a little bit weird, and, and uh, Matt McDougall brought this up in his uh, video expose of this kit, and that is that these flaps are uh, a two-piece sub-assembly, uh, an upper and a lower piece, which is not a big deal, and, and they really don't have any choice because you couldn't mold this thing that thick without having some sink marks. But what's weird about it is that they put the split between top and bottom on the top. And you can see it right there, it runs along all the way along the length of the part right there at the, at the back. And that's a pretty bold move. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's uh, you know, uh, have an ultimate confidence in the fit of your parts. Uh, which with this kit might be a little bit misplaced um, given what we've seen on these things. I'm fortunate mine fit perfectly and there is no further action required. I, I think especially when they're covered with foil that that joint is, is not going to stand out at all. But if they didn't fit perfectly, uh, you know, so that's something to, to test fit for sure before you commit to it because that's going to be right there uh, on the outside where it's visible. The other thing that's a little bit weird is that you can see that the uh, back edge of that has raised rivets, which again is kind of an odd thing. I don't think there's any 
uh, actual precedent f for that. So I'll be knocking those down a little bit with a little bit of sandpaper. But other than that, not a big deal. I'm really pleased with the way that those parts all go together. I mean, overall, you know, the fit of, of the flaps and the ailerons is very Tamiya-like in the way that it happened. So that's all good. Now let's move on to the fuselage. Um, I, a couple of things, as soon as I uh, flipped it over, <laughs> I, had, I had, hadn't you know, worked on this thing in a week or so, and, and I hadn't, had not done anything, hadn't dropped it, uh, nothing you know, catastrophic like that. But when I flipped it over, I discovered that the joint along the radiator scoop had, uh, sp had, had split open. And I've heard other people say this happened to them as well, so not too big of a surprise. But uh, um, I went ahead and flooded some uh, extra thin in there and squeezed on it a bit with a clamp. Uh, so now I'm you know, pretty sure I've got a, about as strong a bond as possible. I also went ahead and added this piece that I had already painted silver. Um, and I think that'll help because it crosses over the, the split and provides uh, a little bit more structural integrity there. <laughs> now, speaking of that part, um, yeah, I think you're really supposed to install that thing before you join the fuselage halves. Uh, you can do it after, like I did, because I just, I wasn't really paying attention. And, uh, you know, you can definitely do it afterwards, but it is a little bit trickier because you kind of have to drop it in there and turn it and fiddle fiddle the this end of it into place and uh it did not want to go all the way down into this receptacle at first and there's a ridge on the back side of it that i had to file a little bit off of uh, the width of it to get it to nestle down into its slot but once i did not really too big of a deal uh, be, it'd definitely be easier for somebody who was not as clumsy as me. Uh, I've also test fit all of the uh, other things associated with the scoop. You know, the louvers, the, the lip of the scoop, and they all fit very nicely. So that's all good. Now, moving on to the other parts of the underside. I've dry fit these, uh, these inserts right here. And I've heard uh, that some guys have had some, some uh, issues getting these to fit all the way in. So not too surprised that mine do not want to go all the way in. You can see they're a little, that one's a little bit proud all the way around. Uh, so, uh, you know, for some people, they might look at that and not notice it or not care. And then proudly declare that they have had no fit issues. But for me, that's, that's not going to cut it. Um, those will be put in after everything is foiled, and they'll probably be painted. Um, I just don't see foiling those as being worthwhile, or it's, I mean, it certainly isn't going to be easy. Um, but uh, uh, that shouldn't be too big of a, of a deal to get those to fit properly. Same, same way on this side. Uh, it just, you know, it drops in flush at the bottom but then still sticks out a bit there at the top. So gonna have to do a little bit of work there. Now, here's one that's a little bit more severe. And again, this is the kind of thing where, you know, some guys may not notice because they just don't really look that close or they just don't care or whatever. But this little chin scoop piece. All right, so if I dry fit that on there, okay. Looking at it from that side, Man, that is bueno, nice and tight. Just nestles right in there. Other, on the other hand, flip it over and look at it on the other side, and you can see that it is sticking out a little, a little proud. Again, not quite as, as good. Uh, so, you know, again, this is the kind of thing where the closer you look, the more you find. And I'm always looking super close. Uh, so I'll just do a little bit of uh, material removal on that, just a little tinkering, and I'm sure that I'll be able to get that to drop in very nicely. All right, so that's all of the underside pieces there uh, that I've looked at on the fuselage. Um, 
the uh, top side, all right, we'll just start at the nose. Um, the spinner, Matt, uh, in his kit, he found that the diameters of these two pieces were not a good match at the joint line there. And he was disgusted enough with it that he went ahead and decided to get the quick boost uh one piece resin spinner which certainly looks better it has a much finer joint line between the front and the back but it has four separate propeller blades which you know is its own sort of challenge um, you'd think that there would be a good compromise between all these things i think i'm probably going to be okay with this joint i mean it's not super tight but you know that's the deal with the mustang spinner whoops i'm sure that's probably spam that's the deal with the Mustang Spinner. It, it is, you know, it, it is two parts, kind of like a, a Spitfire Spinner. So, um, you know, you, you, it's going to have a line there, and you just have to deal with that. Now, um, the next thing that you have to uh, look, that I want to look at on the fuselage, is the uh, fit of the canopy. Not, not the canopy, sorry, the windscreen. The... Um, the windscreen, uh, some guys have found that they've had some issues with it being a little bit too wide. Um, and there may be an explanation for that here. You can see that uh, the uh, thing fits perfectly on that side. Drops right in there the way that you want it to. Uh, has maybe just a tiny skosh of, of gap, but not too big of a deal. On the other side, however, not so much. Does not want to drop in as easily. There's a gap there at the bottom. Now I can smash on it and get it to close up a little bit, but I can feel that it's not wanting to go and that I, it's not something I want to force. Uh, I never want to do that with clear parts because uh, you will, at a minimum, introduce stress marks and maybe even just completely crack it or break it. So I think the culprit is if you look right down there by the uh, uh, by the, the that, that red handle is, uh, I, I forget what that is, but the thing behind it is the canopy crank. And you can see that there's a little nub of, of clear plastic that sticks out from the edge of the windscreen there resting on top of it. If it'll focus right there. There you go. Um, and I think it's pretty easy to decipher that that little nub, you can see it right there, is probably just hitting on that. So I'm going to start by trimming it a little bit and see if that solves the problem. And then we'll go from there. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens. Now, if it still looks like it's, it's, it's uh, sticking out wide, the next thing I'll be looking at is whether or not it's interfering with the outside of where that red handle is, uh, because it is definitely pretty flush there. And if some guys are having problems with that and thinking that the canopy, or sorry, the windscreen part is too wide, that may actually be what's causing it. it, it not so much that it's too wide as it's just being pushed out by uh, interfering right there, which is, you know, could be because it's a little bit thick uh, there at the, at the, uh, the bottom edge of it right there. So if that's the case then I may just relieve some material off the inside of it right there. We'll see. I'll report back on all this stuff uh, in, the, in the next episode, or if there's time later in this one. Okay, uh, next thing um, uh, is the major one here, is the uh, horizontal stabilizers. And Matt also uh, has posted some findings about this, and and has registered some uh, irritation, which I 100% agree with. All right, this is the deal. All right, so you put that in there, and you can immediately see, all right, it's just floppy. Flops all around, Doesn't, won't stay in there at all. All right, and if you push on it, you can see 
that it does look like indeed it is going to be a, a pretty pretty tight fit at least on that one at least on the top you know because it won't stay put I can't flip it over and look at the other side very effectively same thing uh, on the uh, on the starboard side and the issue that Matt and I both have with this is that this is just lazy engineering and it's a continuation of decades of lazy engineering by kit manufacturers who can't seem to come up with a better way to insert horizontal stabilizers. I, I mean, it's just ridiculous. The only one that I can recall seeing uh, in, in any of my projects where I was like, yep, they totally did this right, was on the 148th scale Tamiya Spitfire that I finished not too long ago. They go in there perfectly. The fit is perfect. They stay put. The, I mean, it's, it's exactly the way that it should be done. Now, a couple of guys made a comment that just completely, like, blew my mind. And their point was, well, no, we don't want it to be a tight fit because if it is, then you can't properly, you can't move it to properly align it with the... And I'm like, what? Wait, do, do you not get that the whole point of having it be a tight and positive location uh, in the fit is so that you don't have to line it up. <laughs> I mean, if it's properly engineered and properly molded, that shouldn't be a problem. You know, like with the Tamiya uh, Spitfire kit, it, you know, it occurred to me that, look, it, it is such a positive fit that if it isn't straight, you're going to have real problems. Yes, that is that is an issue. But if it is, uh, it's gonna, you know, it would have to be pretty significant, and it would be coming from someplace else, probably, other than the actual joint right here, unless it was just completely mismolded. Like you might have a twist in the fuselage or something crazy like that. So, yeah, that would be a disaster, but it would be such a huge disaster that. I, you know, I think most guys would, would choose to just ignore it, uh, you know, unless they were gunning for an IPMS trophy, uh, and in which case they'd have to do major surgery. But again, if, if, if everything is the way that it's supposed to be, it, that should be a pretty low risk. So you should be able to do what uh, Matt and I agree should be possible in 2020, and that is to just poke the horizontal stabilizers in there, glue them up, and be confident that everything is going to be plumb and square and, you know, however. Anyway, that's that's kind of the deal with that. Um, one thing about these that I thought was, was pretty thoughtful is this. If you look, the way that they engineered the split, because this is an upper and a lower, uh, just like uh, the flaps, the way that they engineered the split is instead of carrying it all the way out to a knife edge at the tip of the thing, they brought the split underneath like that. And these are handed, so you know when you're putting it on the when you're when you're well on these you can't get it wrong because the top and the bottom are obviously different. But it's really nice because that joint, you know, once you fill and sand it. You're not going to be able to see it no matter what because it's going to be on the bottom. So very cool. I like that. Now about them being handed, and this also applies to the ailerons that you have to pay attention to. They are handed. Um, so you have to pay attention to the ailerons and to the elevators. Um, and the uh, thing to pay attention to is the location of the... Uh, of the control horns or the horns for the uh, linkage on the uh, trim tabs. So I'm just looking in the instructions to make sure that I don't get this wrong. All right, but if you look, the uh, okay, the uh, control horn should be on the bottom uh, when you do the uh, elevators and same thing on the ailerons okay and what I mean by that is this 
little thing right here, okay? That thing right there by my fingernail. That's what I'm talking about. That's the linkage for the trim tab. That little section right there. So just make sure that those are on the bottom and you should uh, be all good as far as having them on the correct side. All right, the last thing real quick uh, I was pretty pleased with, it's two-piece prop sub-assembly and these things notched into each other just perfect. Nice snug fit like you want, so that's ready to go. And I think we're good. Uh, I'll report back on some of these things that needed a little bit of work, but overall I'm pretty pleased uh, with, with the way that all this stuff fits and um, I've got confidence now that I can go forward working on the fuselage because what I think part of the reason that I'm doing this is because all of this uh, is going to get foiled before uh, all of these little bits get added. Like I don't see myself uh, being able to foil around the intake mouth, for example, uh, or the chin scoop. So those will go on after the foil is in place and I definitely don't want to have to be doing any kind of weird uh, adjustments at that point. So I think we're all good. Okay, here we go. I've got a whole pile of questions here printed out on old-fashioned paper. So let's just get right into it and see what we've got. All right, so this is, I'm going to go from oldest to newest. So this goes clear back to episode two. All right, here we go from Peter Soulsby. Will, you have to be one of the most interesting and entertaining video modelers out there. Dude, you need to get out more. <laughs> Anyway, could you give me your mix for your acrylic wash made with AK Ultra Matte? I appreciate how the fragility of the AK product makes it easier to clean off. Would any other matte acrylics work the same? So yes, I mean you can use any kind of an acrylic clear for the magic wash. The mixture, regardless as far as I've been uh, doing it, is 50% clear acrylic, whatever it is, 50% water, about 10, 15, 20% flow aid. You know, I don't get real precise with that. And then whatever your colorant is to taste, whether that's ink uh, or acrylic paint. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, Will, 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 the glue you threw away is the one to use. Clean sir, and then he's referring to when I threw away the uh, micro scale uh, foil adhesive. <laughs> Uh, anyway, clean first, use thinner, dry with airbrush. Apply the glue to the model with a clean flat brush. Wait four to five minutes and apply the clean foil, burnish it down, etc. Do not sand unless you are working around an area that needs stretching. Polish with mother's aluminum polish and you're done. Alternate the direction of the foil to get the panel defect. Send me your phone number and I'll send photos. <laughs> yeah, dude, no, not sending anybody my phone number. Uh, um, but let's kind of work backwards through this. Um, Mothers, got some, I'm going to try it. Uh, I've had several recommendations to use that. Now, as far as uh, the way that this guy recommends uh, applying this, uh, putting the glue on the model, then applying the foil, um, yeah, I, I gotta say, um, I, the, he's literally the only person that I've seen suggest that. Um, the consensus seems to be uh, that you want to put it on the, on the foil. And as far as brushing it, I, look, that's just going to leave you brush marks. And I have yet to see anybody do it a different way that doesn't bear that out, except for one guy. He brought up something that I thought was super interesting. He is basically just slobbering the adhesive on and then uh, putting the foil, once, it, once the, the glue dries, he's putting the foil on an adhesive uh, non-stick sheet. Like you know what I'm talking about where you peel a sticker off, the paper that's left over. He's apparently got a bunch of that from something. Uh, I have some vinyl sheets that I'm going to use because um, this is also a good way to sort of store your foil so that you don't get, you know, dust and, and trash collecting in the adhesive that's, you know, just laying there facing up like some of my 
test pieces did. Anyway, he's once he's got the foil on that piece of paper, he's running it through a laminating machine, which apparently generates enough heat to completely smash and smooth out that layer of adhesive. And he claims that it yields a perfectly uh, even surface. So we'll see. I don't know. But I am going to continue to spray it because uh, I, I, I see no evidence that uh, applying it with a brush is any better. And <laughs> you just kind of a funny story with this guy who sent, uh, who sent this, this message. He was bound and determined to, to show me because uh, a long time ago, I bought the, the, the domain willpattison.com. And I guess he deduced that this was how to get a hold of me because he sent an email and somehow it ended up with the other Will Pattison who used to own that domain. And <laughs> so I got an email out of the blue from Will Pattison, my doppelganger, and he's like, hey, I don't know what this dude's deal is, but I think he's trying to find you. So then he forwards me the message, and this guy sends me this huge long description of how he did it along with some photographs. And mad respect for the determination to you know find me and send me this stuff but i have to say that while his work looked pretty decent overall when i zoomed in on the photos the foil had a level of texture that's just not going to be acceptable for me you guys know i built these things to photograph them up close and even on my test pieces that i've been doing which look pretty impressive from that far away when you really get in there close you can see that there's still texture on there and i'm bound and determined to get as much of that out of there as possible so uh you know we'll see but you know again mad respect to the dude for uh going to the effort of of sending me the information i know he's just trying to help all right, uh, oh, I think I'm gonna have to plug this camera in. It looks like the battery is about to die. Okay, sorry about that. Carrying on. All right, this is from uh, part three. Are they able to, and this is where I talked about the, you know, I got all super nerdy about the tolerance analysis and all that. Uh, are they able to measure where the tolerances of individual pieces fall so that they can be mixed and matched for the best fit? Or does that fall outside the cost benefits for a model? Okay, that's a very good question. So what basically happens is that when any company that manufactures mechanical components decides how they're going to handle their tolerancing and their quality control, they have to make a decision. Uh, because, you know, on one end you examine or, or test none of the parts and just hope for the best. On the other end of your quality assurance program, you examine or test 100% of the parts. Now, on the on the far end of that, uh, there's, you know, I mean, obviously, that's going to take way too much time and cost way too much to test and measure every single dimension of every single part. You just can't do it. And so, like in the automotive industry, they have uh, long worked off of a program called Six Sigma. And sigmas are standard deviations on a bell curve. It's, it's a statistical thing. And six sigma gets you something like 97% of your parts. And so they've figured out ways to work within that uh, as an acceptable or a high quality level that balances the, uh, you know, the uh, issues of quality with the cost of quality assurance. But that's the automotive industry, all right? Let's be honest. The plastic model kit industry, not the same. And I feel pretty sure that beyond visual inspection to hopefully catch things like short shots or warpage or, you know, any kind of damage, that they're not really doing much inspection. I mean, you're talking about in the automotive industry where you're cranking out literally millions of parts per year as opposed to a plastic model kit, which, you know, five, 10, maybe 20,000 parts uh, uh, over its entire lifetime. So again, it just doesn't really pay uh, for these guys who are already probably operating on a pretty slim margin that is, as it is to have somebody sitting there with a set of calipers measuring parts 
especially when you consider that there's really no good way. Let's say that you find this sprue is a little oversized. Now you've got to find another sprue that matches it because it's a little undersized. And then you're going to put those two sprues together in the bag and put them in a box. It's just, it's just not practical. So we really just kind of have to deal with what we get. But that's why tolerance analysis in the design phase is so important. Because you already know that you're not going to be doing that level of quality insurance. So you have to make your parts have just enough slop so that hopefully all of your deviations will fit within what's normal for you know plastic injection molding and this is something where Tamiya and Bandai they kill it they've, they've got that figured out and honestly that may be a cultural thing in a way because the Japanese are famous in the automotive industry for developing quality assurance programs uh, so you know uh, hopefully that that kind of helps you see what the sort of overall picture there is when it comes to uh, tolerancing these things. All right, this guy, James. Will, who is Carlos Starton and why should I care? <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned Carlos a lot because uh, he's, uh, he's my hero, uh, partly because he grows a, a much better beard than I do. But really, Carlos, I mean, you should look at his work. He's one of the best model makers on the planet. And what's impressive about Carlos is that he can do it all. He builds uh, military stuff. He builds amazing 112th motorcycle models, and he's an incredibly good figure painter. And you can see his work on Facebook. Uh, he, he's just, you know, he's just good. And another thing that I like about Carlos, aside from just being an overall cool dude, is that he also kind of has the same view of things that I do when it comes to testing and analyzing your materials and uh, you know using what works the best okay all right I've heard of foil but never seen demonstrated so thanks uh, however how do you finish the foil edges to avoid a step in your case where the fuselage meets the wing okay you, in general you don't really have to deal too much with a step because for starters the foil is like a thousandth of an inch thick and the second thing is, is that, uh, at least as I understand it, with a lot of burnishing and sanding, if you have a visible edge, you can pretty much count on being able to blend it in uh, if you work hard enough at it. As far as the joint between the fuselage and the wing goes on this thing, there's a joint there. That's, that, it exists in real life because that fillet is actually a series of, of curved sheets that are that are attached over the actual wing joint which is underneath there so if I have a little bit of a step that's you know I can always just say well hey that's how it is in real life all right uh, well I missed it I think but what was the brand of sanding sticks you recommend for buffing the aluminum um, I am not really recommending anything yet I mean the infinity sponge sticks are my favorite thing but I'm not convinced yet that um, well I should I should take that back because specifically what I found is that these the sponge sticks did not do as good at flattening that texture as uh, these which Infini calls their uh, what does it say on here uh, yeah I can't read it it's got too much gunk on it but they're the gray ones, the precision sanders. <laughs> they have three different kinds. They've got the zebra, which look like these. These are big and stiff. You know, I use them for kind of what I call gross work. These smaller ones, the precision ones, uh, this is what I got the best finish out of on, the, uh, on, that, on that foil. But I'm not sure that, that, that that's really the right method. Because, uh, I, again, I've got guys saying that I don't need to do anything but polish with mothers. So we'll see. I'm, I'm going to be continuing to experiment. and By the time this is all said and done, I'll know what is my actual favorite. Okay, hey, Gooberhead channel owner. Yep, that's me. Guilty as charged. Uh, if you're going to do delicate parts with super glue and you don't want it sticking to your toothpick or whatever you're using, just dip it in water right before. 
Don't know. I have never tried it, but if that's a good tip, then hey, I'm all about it. I'm going to remember to try it. What he's talking about is where I was holding the uh, seat belts down to the seat while I tried to wick super glue underneath it with my other hand and ended up gluing the toothpick to the seat belt and ripping the paint off of the pre-painted seat belt. So uh, hopefully that, that works because, uh, yeah, that's a good tip. All right, uh, I've never worked with photo etched parts before. You mentioned people having problems with paint coming off. Is there something you can do to prevent you from having that issue? Okay, um, what he's, again, what he's talking about is with pre-painted photo etched parts like seat belts, uh, when you bend them uh, or stick a toothpick to them like I did, yeah, you can sometimes have paint coming off. I honestly have not had much of an issue with that. Um, and, and in the cases that I did, I honestly don't know what I could have done to prevent it. Uh, you know, you have to form the, the, the parts the way that you do. You know, with a seat belt, you've got to bend it over the back of the seat or whatever. So if the paint pops off, I mean, you're just kind of screwed and you gotta, you got to repaint it. Uh, and I don't know what uh, I could have done to prevent that. It's just one of those things where, honestly, you just hope for the best. Okay. Uh, Tony says, Will, just had a thought about part eight, part H50. Um, would that not be for the aerial attachment from the fin through the canopy to the back of the seat? He's talking about this thing on the back of the headrest there. There's two options for that, and I apparently chose the wrong one that is only for Swiss Mustangs. So he may be right. I don't know. But if anybody does know, definitely you know post uh, down in the comments um, what the answer there is. Because uh, I didn't even know there was a difference until I saw it uh, in, the, in the kit. Okay, Will, your videos and articles in scale aircraft modeling are really good. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a nice thing to say. Have you covered your techniques for fitting, attaching, and finishing canopies, especially ones that don't start out fitting too well? I'm glad he asked this, uh, and, and I'm glad I answered it right now because you kind of saw it right there uh, when I was going over the fit of all the small parts where that canopy doesn't quite want to go down uh, as far as it's supposed to. And honestly, the answer is there's no special technique other than a magnifier and a lot of patience and just really taking your time to examine the fit and find those interferences and diagnose what's going on before you do anything crazy. I do that with all parts, but especially with clear parts, because again, the penalty with clear parts is you know, pretty much always going to be, uh, be the highest. Uh, so again, no special technique, just got to be methodical, got to be careful. Okay, uh, here's the next one. Have you done anything uh, other than, uh, uh, let's see, I'm not sure what ISP means, but have you done anything to the plastic surface to possibly enhance the adhesion characteristics of the foil, like gently roughing it up or abrading it with a high grit sandpaper to provide more grip? No, I haven't. Um, I hadn't, you know, seen uh, any of these uh, guys that are really good at it recommending that, or I would have. Um, and I don't want to introduce any texture that I don't have to. And the truth is that uh, as soon as you start sanding and polishing, there's always a chance that you're going to have a scratch that's going to show because you miss it. So... I would prefer not to do anything to the base surface uh, if I don't have to. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, <laughs> this is good. Um, this guy uh, says, uh, you came to the wrong assumption on the painting of the IFF lights. Okay, that's the three lights, the uh, orange, yellow, and green underneath the uh, wing. and. My contention was, or I, I, my idea was, that the bulbs would be colored rather than the lenses because the lenses then could all be the same. Well, that's what I get for thinking because, <laughs> as he says, the lights were made, uh, he says, I, I have a set that I bought off eBay several years ago, which is a pretty cool collector's item. Uh, and he says, the lights are made by Grimes and the lenses are tinted, not the bulbs. And then the housing is painted silver. Uh, so... There you go. 
That's what happens when you uh, when you have a theory. Uh, might sound good when you say it fast, but ultimately prove not to be true. Okay, hi Will. Uh, let's see. Have you ever tried catalyzed body putty? It's like Bondo, only with a much finer grain. Um, and uh, he gives a, some more information about about how it works. Uh, and and the answer is yes. I've used. Uh, two-part uh, putty and what he's talking about is traditional bondo is a is a catalyzed polyester material you get a you get a can of it that looks kind of like uh, you know a can of wax and then you get a little tube of cream hardener and you take the the stuff out of the can you squirt on a little bit of cream hardener you mix it up and then you apply it and it catalyzes just like uh, you know an epoxy or a 2k urethane or something like that and that's what is traditionally used in the automotive industry. And I don't know why it's that way. I don't know why it's two-part versus single part, but I have used it on, like, real body work. I don't use it here because I've just never felt the need to. Um, I can't imagine how the grain could be a whole lot finer than it is in something like 907, that's Bondo Spot Glazing Compound, or that Combi stuff that I've been yeah. using. Um, if it is, it is, but I just haven't ever seen, uh, haven't ever felt compelled to buy a huge big old can of it because, as he points out, it can be kind of expensive. Uh, so, no, I uh, have not tried that. I have not felt the need to. Okay, last one. Uh, hey, uh, I noticed you mentioned your Proxon sander here. I know you have the rotary one too. What model number is that one? Okay, what he's referring to is my wonderful little Proxon pin sander, this thing right here. Um, and it is fantastic. It's the PS13. That's what it says here on the uh, little sticker right there. Um, and I, I love it. it. It's one of those things I honestly almost never use it. Uh, but it's like I told somebody this morning, uh, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a nuclear weapon. You really don't need it very often. You kind of hope you never have to use it, but when you do, you really do need it. So uh, anyway, all right, that's all the questions. Um, if you guys have more, feel free to send them. And uh, once they pile up enough, then I'll do this again if need be. But I hope you guys found that useful. And until next time, as always, I definitely appreciate you watching. Much love.